Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues and today we welcome back an old friend. Indeed, uh, Dr. Glenn Johnson, the Chancellor of the Regents for Higher Education is going to be on with us talking about what's going on in higher education and some of the uh, difficulties he's dealing with and the system is dealing with. We think you'll find this very interesting. Educational funding getting a lot of attention in Oklahoma and few people are in the middle of that as much as Glenn Johnson. So he'll enlighten us today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. can offer is insight into understanding the Native American art, how these artists are expressing themselves as cultural people. I am Heather Ottone. I'm a Native American researcher and curator, and I am Chickasaw. I can remember in first grade the teacher saying, well, you're so lucky you don't look Indian. That was difficult to hear, because it was what I was, it's what I am. I think there's a renaissance going on amongst the tribes. I think the Chickasaws are leading that. We didn't die. We're not gone. So what are we now? And what can we do now to start to form that identity, to survive into another century? And to have the culture guiding us into that future, that would be significant. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict, Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As we indicated in the opening session, we're really pleased to welcome back Dr. Glenn Johnson, the Chancellor of the Regents for Higher Education here in Oklahoma, making his sixth appearance with us. Uh, he's, he comes back when uh, uh, he's got things on his mind or we have things on our mind, and it turns out we're in, in both those situations today. Uh, Glenn uh, did his undergraduate work uh, at the University of Oklahoma where he graduated with honors, did his law work at the University of Oklahoma likewise in an exemplary fashion and uh, was inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, he was in the House of Representatives for 14 years and the last six of which he, in his service he was Speaker of the House of Representatives. He then became president of Southeastern Oklahoma State University in Durant where he served for 10 years. Uh, thereafter, he uh, uh, was named the Chancellor uh, of Regents for Higher Education. In this office, he's held for nine years. And we're really pleased to have you back. It's good to see you. Well, great to be here, Ken Thank you. Beck. Yeah, it's good to see you, Glenn. Beck. We just finished uh, an, an extraordinarily interesting uh, legislative session. Uh, you know, yes. Record shortfalls <laughs> in funding and legislature got beat up seemed like from start to finish they didn't they didn't message well maybe it was deserved maybe it wasn't but as a former speaker who's kind of now on the, on the receiving end right. of a lot of that funding what were, what were your perspectives on the session in general well again starting off it was a very difficult process anytime you begin uh, the cycle the budget cycle and the legislative session with a 1.3 billion dollar shortfall it's going to be a very very tough session and it was uh, you, you look at the having been on the other side you know you're not going to uh, be in a position where everyone's going to be pleased so I think the legislature tried to do the best they could uh, working with the governor uh, but obviously with the shortfall of that magnitude there was going to be uh, significant cuts mm -hmm. to most of the agencies uh, higher education was one of those and in fact I, we uh, ended up sustaining the largest uh, dollar amount uh, cut of, of any entity in government. Um, I think, uh, again, you look at it, they made an effort to, as much as they could, 
uh, get the K through 12 system uh, as close to a flat budget as they could. There were efforts made with regard to the health care authority and, and Medicaid. So uh, some priorities were established, but with that significant of a shortfall, uh, I think everyone knew it was going to be a, a tough ending, and it was. The impression from the outside was that they didn't seem to be working on it very significantly during the session. It seemed like it all came down to the end. Mm -hmm. Was that just an outsider's perspective? Were there things going on that, that maybe those of us on the outside didn't know? There were. I know because in, in my role I visit with the budget chairs, uh, uh, Representative Earl Sears, Senator Clark Jolly regularly, mm -hmm. uh, several times a week. And there, w there was work that was going on with committees, with ad hoc groups on different segments of the budget. A lot of that, of course, is not uh, where it's out there, where, where mm -hmm. it's being covered uh, with the media and, and with other outlets. But no, there was significant work going on uh, throughout the session. And frankly, even in the fall, we had meetings uh, from our standpoint in higher education, we had more meetings with the budget principals, uh, both the budget chairs and, and uh, President Dorflinger on behalf of Governor Fallon in the in the early and late fall before the session than we ever had before. So I think they did anticipate this was going to be a, an unusual year because of the uh, magnitude of the shortfall and, and I think they did their work to try to uh, come together and, and have uh, once you get a plan, of course, getting consensus and, and normally in a four month session it, it usually comes together the last two weeks. That's essentially what happened this time and, and that's where the bills were voted on the last week of the session. One other question before we get into the specifics of, 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 of education funding. Um, it seemed like this was an opportunity for the legislature to put the reset button. In other words, change some of the ways that government is funded in the state. I didn't see a lot of that taking place. Was this a missed opportunity? Well, I think you could you could look at it in some areas. It probably was. There was considerable discussion on some of the tax credits in terms of, of mm -hmm. taking a second look at those. Uh, they did make some changes in some, but there were certainly uh, some areas that were, were left on the table. The, the wind uh, tax as an example and, and others, which again, that is the process. There wasn't enough of a consensus to move forward in both houses. Uh, and when that happens, you, you don't move it forward. There, were, there continues to be discussion about some of the structural issues, money that's taken off the top. And, and while I think the discussion and debate was good and it will continue, um, uh, again, a lot of those things didn't come together uh, this session. So I think uh, many of those issues as we go into this next year will be uh, subject of discussion, debate, and probably legislation going forward because I think there's still concern about the structural problems that, uh, that precipitate some of this. Uh, Chancellor, I noticed that uh, the budget cut to higher education generally was around almost 16 percent, 15.92 percent. Uh, how is that going to impact the institutions themselves? Uh, I'm not only named two, there are a lot more than two, OU and OSU. Right. I noticed both of them in recent days have increased tuition. Are, is an increase in tuition going to solve the, the problem brought about by the diminution in the funding? Uh, the short answer to that, Ken, is no. Um, basically, in response to your question on what's the impact, yeah. uh, the impact of this cut, 15.92% or 16% in dollar amounts, it's $153 million. And in fact, we uh, about two weeks ago had another, we're a recipient of money from the Gross Production Tax Fund. There was another shortfall there, so our actual total reduction for the year ended up being $157 million. That's about one-sixth of our budget. And, cool. and so in the state regents, uh, our cut ended up being 20%, uh, so even a little more, or one-fifth. So that's staggering. It's particularly staggering our, over the last seven or eight years, our enrollments have increased. And of course, I've talked with both of you before about our goals on that are goals of Governor Fallon as well in the legislature to increase the number of college graduates, which, which then in turn will uh, produce uh, Oklahomans that will fill the job needs and our workforce needs going forward. Basically, just OU and OSU uh, will be either through unfilled positions or uh, actual layoffs. So OU is going to uh, have reduced those numbers by uh, 352. Uh, o the OSU system, I don't just mean OSU Stillwater, all of their constituent yeah. agencies, Vet Med, the Ag uh, Experiment, uh, OSU Tulsa, all the related areas of Oklahoma State University, uh, right at 600 
uh, employees. So that's significant. You take a, an institution like Cameron as an example, uh, layoffs of, of 30 faculty and staff or positions that will not be filled, faculty positions that need to be filled. So the, the spinoff on this, uh, as we're moving to produce more college graduates, we've got courses that need to be taught where students can graduate on time that in some instances won't be, where students will now have to take longer to earn their degree because of these cutbacks. Uh, we've seen throughout the system some pretty innovative things. Uh, Southeastern Oklahoma State University and Murray State College are actually combining and sharing a business officer now. I, I would submit that's probably uh, innovative, but necessary because of the budget cuts. We've seen consolidation of campus sites and the Muskogee campus is at Connor State College. The OSU A&M system is consolidating back office functions, human resources, payroll, accounting, where they're doing that on behalf of the entire five institutions that are under their system. So. I hope my message is we're doing some things that I think are innovative and on track to try and deal with this very significant shortfall. But I think our concern, not only this year but going forward, a 16% cut is very significant. It is significant in terms of we're, we're going to give it 110% to meet our college degree completion goals through Complete College America. The first three years we've been in the initiative that Governor Fallon announced back in 2011, we've exceeded our goals for the year. And our commitment is to, to continue to do all we can to do that. But what we're seeing is other states, Georgia as an example, is putting new money into uh, more intensive advisement, uh, more uh, course offerings, and things that drive degree completion. And of course, our cut this year was very significant, 16%. But over the last eight years, our cut has exceeded uh, $200 million in higher education, again, at a time when we have more students. So. More students, less money, that, that's not a good recipe in terms of, of putting the higher education system in a way where we can do what we need to do, and that's deliver in terms of producing more college graduates. And quite frankly, uh, having the jobs that are out there, Georgetown study last year uh, told us that by 2020, which is only four years away, that 67% uh, uh, of those jobs will require some post-secondary education and 37% of the jobs in Oklahoma will require uh, uh, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree or higher. And mm -hmm. so certainly we feel that pressure and to do that, uh, the bottom line is we need the resources in order to put into our institutions to provide our students with the courses uh, where we can continue our effort to produce more graduates in the job areas where we need jobs. Glenn Johnson is the Chancellor for Higher Education in the state of Oklahoma. We'll have more with Glenn right after this. Life-sustaining clean water in places where access to it requires more than the turn of a faucet. An engineer creates a plastic filtration device using natural gas compounds. By removing viruses and bacteria, these innovations bring relief and confidence to entire communities. Oklahoma resources are serving a bigger purpose beyond our state. Let's use them to solve even more challenges. Good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers and our guest today, the Chancellor for Higher Ed in the state of Oklahoma, Dr. Glenn Johnson. 
I think there may be a, a misperception out there that, that higher ed can easily withstand these double-digit cuts. What's your perception on that? Well, I think we have certainly heard that from some, some quarters, uh, Mick, but that's really not the case at all. Um, probably a good, uh, good way to illustrate that. We have a, uh, a requirement that our institutions keep essentially 8% of their allocation in reserves for unanticipated emergencies. A tornado, a flood, wh whatever it might be. Um, right now, of the 25 institutions, 16 are not able to meet that minimum requirement because over the last several years, the reserves have been depleted because of the budget cuts. Uh, even probably equally important, our accrediting entity, the Higher Learning Commission, uh, when they come in and look at our academic programs, they want to make sure there's reserves in order to sustain those programs. And obviously, they, their benchmark is 10%. So I think we have some concerns there. We are not, if, if, we, could, if we could just access reserves and, and essentially be okay and deal with the budget cut, we wouldn't be laying off the 400 employees or the 350 at OU, the, the 600 at OSU. System-wide, those numbers, unfilled positions, and layoffs come to right at 2,000 uh, employees. That's significant. We wouldn't be doing that if we could easily absorb this. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing some real pain. Several of our institutions this spring implemented furloughs, unpaid days. Uh, so I think the perception is out there, but it's not uh, a perception that's uh, accurate. Uh, some will say we can utilize tuition, but again, uh, tuition just increases the burden on, on students and families and, and parents and we've actually got some really good information on uh, where we rank nationally on affordability. Uh, we have the la this last year uh, the U.S. Chamber study ranks Oklahoma fifth uh, in the nation, Oklahoma higher education fifth in the nation in overall affordability, not just tuition fees but housing, books, the related cost of going to college, and then another study by the U.S. Department of Education that centers only on the four-year institutions. We're ranked third in the nation. Only Utah and Wyoming are more affordable than Oklahoma out of the 50 states. So we're, we've done a great job in terms of keeping college affordable, uh, but these cuts, we are not able to absorb them without significant uh, reduction, not only in our, to our academic programs, but also to our students and the services we provide our students. Glenn, talk a little bit about what is the Southern Regional Education Board, uh, why does it exist, and what kind of data does it generate that's useful? It was uh, founded in 1948. Uh, the states that comprise the Southern Regional Education Board, or SREB, essentially are the states that start with Oklahoma and Texas in the west, and the, it goes east and southeast, uh, Tennessee, Florida, all of those traditional southern states going to Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware in the north, and West Virginia, Kentucky. Uh, so it's a consortium of, essentially of, of those states. Primarily, uh, we're, we're in the Midwest area, but primarily the, uh, the southeast, but on up to uh, the, the east coast with Maryland and Delaware. Uh, put together to promote education in each of those states at the higher ed, K through 12 level and career tech level. And uh, they produced a, a study uh, about a month ago that I think in a couple of areas is very significant uh, for Oklahoma and, and particularly Oklahoma higher education. The first, uh, they ranked the tuition charges of the 16 states and Oklahoma's tuition is of the 16, the lowest in that 16 state quadrant. Uh, by the same token, in the area of degree completion, college degree completion, we rank third uh, out of those 16 states in terms of producing from a percentage standpoint more additional degrees than any of the other uh, states except for, for two others. In the very important area of online learning and e-learning we ranked fourth and we will our numbers will go up even further this next year because we've had some pretty intensive participation in state re reciprocity agreements on online education I think I've talked about it when I've been in here before with both of you. Online education is here to stay. It's becoming uh, certainly an avenue for some students and, and as students earn their degrees, it's, it's a component for many of them in, in providing avenues for them to earn their degrees. And we're into that space in a big way. Our regents have an online task force where we're approaching it from a system-wide standpoint. So we have our two research institutions, OU and OSU, but all of our regionals in two years as well. The final statistic that came out of this SREB report told us that in terms of faculty salaries, 
Uh, we rank second lowest of the 16 states, and, and I'm not sure that's a good thing, uh, but in terms of there are some that say that uh, our, our faculty salaries are too high, certainly this data tells a, a different, more accurate story. So I think on a lot of those benchmarks on degree completion, uh, on uh, additional degrees and the uh, uh, online learning category and certainly on affordability, we came out, Oklahoma came out looking, <coughs> looking very good in this report and certainly uh, I think that's the, uh, the status we enjoy within the SREB states. There's increased attention on student debt and yes. I, it's a little bit of a quandary because we want to encourage young people to, to attend college or to, to seek higher education. And, and I assume there's this in, in impression that even if they have to borrow money, it's still a good investment yeah. for them in general. But then you hear the horror stories about, about students who have graduated and they have you know, sometimes six figures of, of mm -hmm. debt and, right. and they're in their 40s and they're still paying off their college debt. What's your view on that? Well, I think what we have to do, Mick, is, is separate the Oklahoma story from the national story. The national story is one that we all, I think, rightly should be concerned about. You hear the stories of trillion dollar debts. Uh, a lot of that is quite frankly, East Coast institutions and West Coast institutions and, and our Ivy League colleges and universities. Uh, and, and our story is a much different story in Oklahoma. And again, a better story. Three major points. First of all, half of our students leave Oklahoma colleges and universities with zero debt. Those that have debt, mm. our debt is 30% below the national average. And a report that just came out in November from the National Center for Student Debt ranked Oklahoma overall as seventh in the nation in terms of our students leaving Oklahoma colleges and universities with the least amount of student debt. So I, I think, again, we have to separate the national story and the national concern from, again, we can always do better and we strive to do better, but our, our story on student debt here is one that where we compare very well uh, mm -hmm. when you look at it nationally. Why does the interest rate on student debt have to be as high as it is? You know, we hear about low interest rates mm -hmm. and, you know, you can borrow a house or you borrow for a car and you hear like, you know, it's 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. And then student debt seems like it's 7.5% or more. Why is it's, there such a disparity? It's higher and it's yeah. set that way based on all of the criteria that they use, but it is a concern. and. Is it, is it based on a default rate in, in some extent? Is that is. partially That's why it's one of, That is one no. of the factors. It's a, it's a series of criteria that go, goes to determining the amount, but I think that is a concern because it is certainly in this environment that we've been in for the last several years with lower interest rates, it's, it's one that uh, is slightly higher and that, that is a concern. How does the uh, financial situation in Oklahoma affect the ability of our colleges and universities to recruit good faculty? Well, I think uh, I, I, it does, there's no question, and I'm concerned this year with uh, a faculty member that's looking at several options and looking at a 16% cut. I'm, yeah. I'm not concerned about, I mean, I am concerned about what those optics look like. Uh, the flip side is we've been very uh, uh, aggressive in our efforts to raise private money for the endowed chair program. That was a program I was involved yeah. in uh, during my time in the legislature and, and authored uh, the bill in 1988 where you supplement uh, the, the salary with the private money and in, in many disciplines, if you have donors that have an interest in a particular discipline, it, it allows uh, the college and university to bring in literally the best and the brightest uh, professors to, uh, to provide a, an enhanced learning opportunity for students. But I think uh, even with that, and we've been very successful, and, and I've got to say the legislature and the governor has been helpful in matching uh, the endowed chair's money on several occasions, the last time uh, three years ago, even with a downturn in the economy. So I want to I want to say we appreciate that very much. But this year with that significant of a cut, I think we do have concerns that you have faculty members that will be looking at several states and they, they'll look at that and it, it won't be uh, necessarily the best picture yeah. that we'd like to present. And, and on the flip side, you know, faculty that are here that may have options and uh, uh, it may, you know, it may, we want to retain the good faculty that we have and I uh, do want to say we've got a great, we've got a great faculty throughout our system. We, we see how they contribute not only in the classroom but uh, in the research area in terms of civic engagement and uh, we have a great system. Yeah. Glenn Johnson, our guest today on The Verdict. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, man. Yeah, th thanks thank for you, your Kent. good work. My pleasure. You know, well, we we promised you. enlightenment and we got it. Kent and I will have a <laughs> final word when we get back.
There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here, drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do it legally. I wanted to because this is my home. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we could help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, we're wrapping up a show with Glenn Johnson, the Chancellor of Higher Education in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah, Glenn has an enormous responsibility and he's dealing with, uh, <clears throat> frankly, inadequate resources and doing a grand job kind of spreading them around. We have a website where you can get more information on Glenn and his office. It's okhighered.org. That's okhighered.org. And we have a website. We'd love for you to check it out and tell us about a guest that you'd like to see or a subject you'd like to see us addressed. It's theverdict.tv. We'll see you next week.